can I ask you, you'll see the, the screen well? Uh, it looks good from here, uh, Basim. Okay, perfect. Yes. Uh, Dr. Sugar Baker, you may start now. Okay, so uh, Basim, thanks very much for the invitation to speak. And it's uh, certainly uh, a pleasure to uh, interact again with the uh, uh, group from uh, Egypt. Um, you are very important in the world in terms of the uh, uh, advancement of the uh, uh, treatment of peritoneal metastases, uh, having really forged a successful uh, effort uh, in Cairo at the National Cancer Institute and at several other uh, hospitals. So um, I'm sorry that I'm not there uh, in order to uh, interact with you uh, uh, person to person. But uh, I'm gonna try and have us all think together to learn together um, about this uh, really uh, um, very uh, work intensive uh, uh, publication that came out uh, just, uh, just uh, last week. I think we can learn a lot from it as to how things should be uh, done in the past uh, Basim, I, I think I mentioned this to you before, but the, the thing I liked best about the uh, Lancet presentation was the uh, comment uh, by, uh, by um, the Mass General Group uh, that's um, Dave Ryan. And uh, uh, Dave says, uh, the results of Prodigy 7 um, should deter automatic use of oxaliplatinum HIPEC. Uh, now investigators should uh, evaluate other uh, novel perioperative treatments, uh, including other and more uh, likely effective HIPECs and then if I would paraphrase what, uh, what uh, Dave Ryan uh, said, he said, um, th there's, there's just a lot, a, a lot more uh, opportunities uh, for us to explore um, the management of, of peritoneal metastases. And uh, then just a, a final preliminary comment, Basim, if I could, we're all, we're all searching for this magic bullet. We, we'd like to see our surgery, which is a complete response, a surgical complete response. We'd like to see something, whether that's combined intraperitoneal and systemic chemotherapy or work with some molecular agents, or we'd like to see something preserve that surgical complete response within the abdomen and pelvis. I must say I've worked for 30 years to try and do that. I was very disappointed in, in the HIPEC uh, that uh, was uh, initiated by uh, the French group. But uh, I think we're still looking for that magic bullet that's going to revolutionize, really change uh, gastrointestinal and gynecologic malignancy. Let's have the next slide, Basim. Okay. I don't have any disclosures. So, um, I'd like to try and learn from this uh, Prodigy 7 randomized controlled test of HIPEC. Now, throughout the presentation, uh, I probably won't talk much about HIPEC because I don't think that Prodigy 7 used HIPEC. It used what I call CHIP or what the French call CHIP chemotherapy, hyperthermic intraperitoneal. Uh, it was not a standard HIPEC, as we all know. It was only 30 minutes, uh, no chance for hyperthermia to do its job. Um, there was an ultra high dose of oxaliplatinum, most of which was removed from the peritoneal cavity and went down the drain. Um, 
but uh, uh, I, I think we can learn from this CHIP uh, trial. Next slide. Okay. Sorry for that. I'm trying to minimize. Uh... It's okay. So here we go. This is the correct slide. Now, so just to review for us, so it's fresh in our minds as to uh, what this randomized control uh, study was. There were 264 colorectal cancer patients, all of whom had documented peritoneal metastases at some time or other. <coughs> they were treated over a 10-year period from 17 different French institutions. I think they uh, entered over 100 patients from Lyon, and some uh, institutions uh, entered only uh, a, a couple of uh, patients. So there's, there's a, a large diversity in terms of the learning curve here. So the, the uh, use of HIPEC was uh, very unusual in my, uh, uh, in, my, in, in my judgment, very unusual HIPEC that all the pharmacologic studies that I have done would not have uh, chosen this, this uh, um, methodology. Very high dose, 400 milligrams per meter squared, plus a little bit of, little touch, little touch of 5-FU, not enough 5-FU to really do anything, to be very honest with you. And we'll come back to that as to when does oxaliplatinum work? It doesn't work with just a little touch of five fluorouracil, 400 milligrams. You need like 2,000 milligrams of five FU to make the uh, uh, to make full fox work. And the treatment was for 30 minutes, supposedly at 43 degrees. Well, anyway, uh, next slide. So this is a, a real um, a shortcoming of the uh, of the trial. They didn't really. Um, they didn't really plan the total package of treatments that, that these patients had. 84% um, of them had neoadjuvant Folfox. That means 60% didn't have any. Um, supposedly, everybody had at least 12 cycles total but some of them had uh, a few cycles before and more cycles afterwards. And this was all at the uh, quote, discretion of the surgeon. And I'll come back to that because, you know, one of the, one of the things that we know from regional chemotherapy is that if you, if you initiate a, a successful systemic treatment, let me say that again, if you initiate a successful systemic treatment, the, the, the regional treatment ha has no meaning. And of course, we have huge numbers of examples of that from breast cancer uh, and from, uh, from melanoma. Uh, so uh, this, this uh, kind of undisciplined use of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, I think is a real shortcoming of the uh, trial. Next. So it was reported as an abstract uh, some three years ago, and uh, uh, I haven't uh, had a chance to update this uh, uh, slide, but it was, uh, was uh, uh, reported in the Lancet Oncology uh, just, uh, just last week. Next. So this is an important slide. Now let's let's uh, look at it a little bit. So if you look at the, the no HIPEC green line, and you look at the uh, uh, HIPEC red line, there's a real separation there. Definitely a separation. 
And uh, Peter Caution, who was one of the reviewers here, he figured this out. And there's a, a significant disease-free survival advantage for the uh, chip. I mean, it's not much, but there is, uh, there is an advantage. And if you look at the one-year survival, it's quite, uh, quite impressive, 59% uh, versus 46%. If this were a drug, uh, it would uh, be approved uh, very soon. So disease-free survival at the 0 0.04, significant. Next slide. Now this is the disease-free survival, this is the overall survival now, um, I think this is inaccurate. Finally, there were 16 crossovers, 16 crossovers from no HIPEC to HIPEC, along with a second look. Again, Peter Caution and I, as we reviewed this, um, we would find a 13% survival advantage if the HIPEC patients were considered as a group, both those who received it as part of the trial and those who received it as, as, as a, a crossover. When you have over 10% of your uh, experimental group crossing over to the 10% uh, uh, of the control group crossing over to the uh, experimental group, uh, you, you have a situation that's uh, uh, really uh, uh, impossible to uh, interpret in my, uh, in my uh, estimation. So again, just to review the, the overall survival, possibly depending on how you want to look at the data, significant, and then the disease-free survival uh, also significant. So my conclusion is that there is positiveness it's not interpreted as a, as, as a positive trial, but there is positiveness in this uh, uh, HIPEC uh, uh, oxaliplatinum. Next. Now there's this strange, uh, which was not published actually in, in the uh, uh, Lancet, this uh, strange finding of those people who did not have the neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So it's not a large number of people. It's the PCIs between 11 and 15. And there's a, a rather interesting a survival advantage uh, in these people with this kind of mid-range uh, PCI. And the way I would interpret this is that if the PCI is more than 15, okay, we know that adding HIPEC uh, is, uh, is a stretch. It doesn't uh, help that much. And if it's less than 11, these are almost undoubtedly the neoadjuvant chemotherapy responders. So in some respects, this is the group of patients that I'd be interested in, those who have a moderate range of PCI and who did not have the uh, neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy. So again, if you're looking for positiveness in this trial, it's there, but uh, I'm not sure it's ever gonna make it to uh, a publication. It certainly did not make it to uh, the Lancet Oncology. Next slide. Um, I think there are some serious strategy flaws and some even more serious pharmacologic flaws in what uh, I've referred to as the quick chip, chemo hyperthermia intraperitoneale a la French. Next slide. So um, we all know, we all know that the greatest weakness, the greatest weakness of HIPEC is this brief exposure of the peritoneal disease to cancer chemotherapy. Um, one treatment is uh, not sufficient. I always say HIPEC is necessary, but not sufficient. 
Prodigy 7 greatly expanded this theoretical shortfall of intraperitoneal cancer control. Indeed, if prolonged contact, if prolonged contact of cancer th chemotherapy and the cancer nodules is necessary, Prodigy 7 would be, predict would be predicted for failure. And indeed, uh, there was failure. Next slide. So, um, what about this use of neoadjuvant chemotherapy to be followed by HIPEC? Well, uh, I can tell you that the Dutch think you either have to choose neoadjuvant chemotherapy or choose HIPEC. One basically begins to cancel out the other. The Swedes, totally the same thing. Why here? Uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy and HIPEC using the same uh, uh, drug, the, the same oxaliplatinum used for, for both. How that was expected to be successful, I don't know. The trial was definitely heavily front-loaded with responders. If NAC was used to identify patients with tumor biology most likely to benefit from CRS and HIPEC, this didn't work. Um, and again, if another trial is done, the, 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 the uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy and the HIPEC must be chosen so that they complement rather than cancel out the uh, respective uh, effects. Next slide. So what happens when you have a NAC response, a neoadjuvant chemotherapy response as a selection criteria? Well, it's nice that the patients entered into the RCT had an unusually long median survival. My median survival is 36 months. The median survival of this group was 42 months. I'm convinced that that's because responders to neoadjuvant chemotherapy were selected to enter this trial. The PCI was extremely low. My median PCI is 15. A 58% uh, uh, of the, the people had a PCI of less than 11. That's a, a very favorable group of patients, probably for the most part based on the fact that they selected patients with a neoadjuvant chemotherapy response. So a weak, quick chip and a strong knack negated the effects of HIPEC. And if I had to choose one reason why I thought this trial is less successful, it's this same use of neoadjuvant chemotherapy and HIPEC using the same drug. And here, an effective systemic treatment will always override regional treatments. In selecting for a NAC response, regional treatment effects were lost. Too bad. Just too bad. Next trial. Next to slide. So I did this uh, study in, in um, collaboration with uh, uh, Bob Nagorny uh, out in Los Angeles. And if, if what we did is we took cancer cells from patients who had been treated with uh, Folfox, okay? And if they had been treated with Folfox within two months, we could look at their response in vitro to oxaliplatinum. And here the black line shows, here we are, more resistant. So by these in vitro studies, if you want to raise a, a uh, population of cancer cells that's resistant to oxaliplatinum, just treat them with Folfox up front. And I have to say, it, it, it makes total and complete sense. They also used uh, uh, neoadjuvant 5-FU, of course, because they used Folfox. Again, the responses to 5-FU were greatly uh, reduced. Now, responses to mitomycin C are preserved. This is the more sensitive uh, uh, group. So uh, unfortunately, this group 
decided, I think kind of at last minute, to use this uh, chip rather than to use a standard 90 minutes of uh, uh, mitomycin C, and too bad. But the in vitro data would strongly suggest that cells taken from patients treated with Folfox will not respond well at all to uh, oxaliplatinum in vitro. Next. So number two flawed strategy. Uh, to summarize, oxaliplatinum 5-FU and leucovorin as NAC Folfox eliminated colorectal peritoneal metastases to the quick chip. Next. Now, unfortunately, this is the pilot study for uh, the Prodigy 7 published by Elias uh, here in JCO. I actually reviewed this manuscript and said, yes, it should be published. But this is patients who had high pec and cytoreductive surgery. Let me say that again. This is a group of patients who had a high pec and cytoreductive surgery. This is a group of patients who had full fox. So uh, the, the pilot study had assumed that high pec had made the big difference in survival here, and they didn't figure in that one group had cytoreductive surgery and the other group did not. The pilot study upon which this, this uh, uh, Prodigy 7 was based is seriously flawed. Next. Now, this is a problem. This is a problem for all of us, and I don't know how to get around it except to try and use neoadjuvant chemotherapy absolutely as little as possible. So bear with me here. Let's take a look at this. The PCI in this trial was determined after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. This has little or no association with the actual extent of disease, but is really an indication of the response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. 222 of the 263, 84% of the patients had neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So we really don't have any data on 84% of the patients as to what their PCI was. If we assume that NAC, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, was used on patients because they needed it, to achieve a CC0 resection. Most of these patients had a PCI not curable by CRS and HIPEC. Somehow or other, in every future trial, we need to assess the PCI prior to the use of NAC, whether that's gonna be done radiologically or with the laparoscope, uh, I don't know, but using a PCI uh, after neoadjuvant chemotherapy is uh, a misuse, is a serious misuse of the uh, peritoneal uh, cancer index. Next slide. Um, pharmacologic flaws. Okay, well, I've spent uh, 30 years trying to, to uh, optimize, and I think we've made some real progress trying to optimize a combination of uh, cytoreductive surgery and perioperative uh, chemotherapy with hyperthermia. This was a terrible flawed use of hyperthermia, terrible flawed use of oxaliplatinum. And as a matter of fact, even though they gave a huge dose, 400 milligrams per meter squared, there was a very low tissue dose of oxaliplatinum. So next slide. So uh, this is the effects of hyperthermia alone. We've all seen these uh, slides. This is time for treatment. And then this is the survival here on the vertical axis. The only way you can get hyperthermia to induce an effect at uh, 30 minutes is by initiating a burn. So 45.5 degrees is 
a near burn. 46 degrees is a burn. And there is just no way that uh, 43 degrees for 30 minutes did absolutely, here's 43 degrees, couldn't have done anything uh, in terms of uh, uh, having an effect on the uh, free intraperitoneal tumor cells. So um, 30 minutes of hyperthermia was no hyperthermia. Next. Um, the other problem is that there really aren't any in vivo tests showing that oxaliplatinum is augmented by heat. I did the studies uh, in vivo with a um, mouse foot pad assay. You can only get heat augmentation of, of, of oxaliplatinum by using very high doses of oxaliplatinum. We, we don't have any data on colorectal cancer, uh, gastric cancer, or uh, pancreas cancer. Next slide. Um, serious flaw here. Now, we all know about Folfox chemotherapy, and we all know that it's made a huge difference in the response rate of uh, colorectal cancer to systemic chemotherapy. But let's look at the facts here. Oxaliplatinum alone, oxaliplatinum alone, which is basically what we had in the Prodigy 7, um, is, not, <coughs> is not an effective agent, only a 20% response rate. Worse than uh, mitomycin C worse than doxorubicin. In order to see a response of oxaliplatinum, you need a dose of 5-FU by continuous infusion of 2,400 milligrams per meter squared. The dose of fluorouracil in the quick chip, 400 milligrams per meter squared. If you ask a medical oncologist, next slide. If you ask a medical oncologist, what is it that people are responding to when you give them Folfox? About two thirds of the response is 5-fluorouracil, and one third of the response is oxaliplatinum. Now that's a guess, that's a guess uh, by the medical oncologic uh, community, but here's the Folfox that we all use, Folfox 7. We give the leucovorin and the oxaliplatinum up front here uh, by a uh, a two hour infusion. And then there's this 46 hour infusion of 2,400 milligrams of 5 fluorouracil. Now, we had 400 milligrams per meter squared as a bolus with the uh, quick chip. Not, not a reasonable use of uh, a good uh, 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 doublet a good doublet, oxaliplatinum and 5-FU for response to colorectal cancer. Next slide. So this is a study uh, done by uh, Kurt van der Spieten and myself in a uh, PhD thesis. What we see here in red is what's discarded when you put 400 milligrams per meter squared into the peritoneal space of a patient with peritoneal metastases. Two thirds of the drug goes nowhere. One third of the drug, 37%, 37% of the drug actually goes into the tissues and has an opportunity to uh, help control the malignant process. But the total oxaliplatinum utilized out of this 460 milligrams per meter squared is only 150 milligrams per meter squared. Next slide. So I conclude that the ASCO presentation by Kinet and the publication in Lancet Oncology uh, interpreted as a totally negative trial is not an accurate report of the data. I think there is some 
positiveness in this trial. And I have to tell you that the French may have uh, deserted the quick trip, but the, the Swedes have not. They're attempting to approve, improve it. Um, now, the improvement in disease-free survival of 0.4% and an overall survival advantage of 13% when crossovers are considered uh, is, uh, would, would make this a, a fairly reasonable uh, first step. But unfortunately, the quick chip suffered from four strategic flaws and three pharmacologic flaws. Next, uh, next slide. Um, recommendations for current use of HIPEC. So if you're going to use NAC, full fox, you need to establish the PCI by laparoscopy prior to initiating treatment. And only patients with a PCI of under 20 are eligible for our aggressive peritoneal metastases surgical interventions. So up front, accurate staging of the patients using PCI. If you're going to use neoadjuvant chemotherapy with Folfox, uh, for, for God's sake, don't then use the same drug that's been worn out by the systemic chemotherapy as your HIPEC. I would suggest if neoadjuvant Folfox is used up front, use mitomycin C. Um, at, at uh, uh, the, the, the recommended doses, and, and that is somewhat uh, variable around the world, but use mitomycin C at a respectable uh, dose. The most effective strategy is CRS first, followed by what I call perioperative Folfox. Perioperative, we're not throwing oxaliplatinum away. It's a good drug, but we're going to use it much differently than in the quick chip. Next slide. So this is the way I use oxaliplatinum as HIPEC. And I've used it a lot. We've reported it in the literature, and I would like to see it used more because uh, it has a very real possibility for greatly improving our uh, results of treatment of peritoneal metastases. So what are we gonna do? First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna give a bolus of 5-fluorouracil 400 milligrams per meter squared with leucovorin. That's at the, f at the completion of the cytoreduction. We've got 200 milligrams per meter squared of oxaliplatinum. That's the Wake Forest regimen, but we're adding to that by continuous infusion, 12 hours, 800 milligrams per meter squared of 5 fluorouracil. And at the end, we're going to do an installation of 400 milligrams per meter squared. In other words, you close the abdomen, into the belly goes 400 milligrams per meter squared. We've got almost two grams per, per uh, a meter squared of 5 fluorouracil going into this patient along with a comfortable dose of oxaliplatinum and the responses within the peritoneal space should be very high. Next slide. This is the uh, HIPEC trial that's uh, been proposed by uh, Jason Foster. It has not yet been um, uh, activated by uh, ECOG. Um, the dose of oxaliplatinum here is, I'm sorry, the dose of mitomycin C is 20 milligrams per meter squared. Um, this is uh, supposedly to be activated at some time in the 2021, whether indeed the NCI will approve it or not, I don't know, but I hope they will. Um, patients will all get upfront, there will be a uniform uh, treatment of, of neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy and, and uh, a pre-treatment laparoscopy built into the trial. 
Next slide. That's my final slide, uh, Basim. Yes, yes. And I'm open to uh, discussion, uh, if indeed there is any. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Sugar Baker. Uh, very interesting. Minutes, and uh, I'm sure we have too many uh, too many questions will uh, come up. Uh, so I will uh, hold myself and I wait for, I think I have Dr. Yasser Debeke. Dr. Debeke. Uh, actually, Debeke is like a, a very famous cardiothoracic surgeon. And I mentioned to him before, uh, he was in uh, Texas uh, and uh, I'm sure we all know. Okay, go ahead, Yasser. Yeah, uh, Michael DeBakey was actually a good friend of my father's, uh, Basim. Oh, who, uh, okay. yeah, and he, he, Michael DeBakey came to Jefferson City on a few occasions uh, with his uh, uh, aortic allografts, and when we had a uh, <laughs> a perforated abdominal aortic aneurysm there in Middle Missouri, uh, uh, Michael DeBakey would get in his personal plane and fly up and replace the aorta and and be gone by uh, five o'clock. Oh, he was he was an unbelievable fellow. That's yes, an unbelievable yeah. guy. Yes, uh, I think you have to unmute yourself, Yasser, and go ahead with your question if you have. Hi, Dad. Go ahead. It's a great uh, honor, Dr. Shiger Picker, to share us uh, our webinar. Uh, we're really happy for this joining live uh, on air. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, number one, uh, you have widely criticized. Uh, show limitations uh, of one of the most important randomized control trials comparing uh, cytoreductive surgery with HIPIC versus uh, no HIPIC. So my question uh, is, what are the, the real on-ground advantages that we could build up uh, on uh, this uh, very important trial for our guidelines? Am I clear? Yeah, so I think, uh, let me rephrase your question. So you're saying, what is the end of that uh, product seven trial that was published? What, what we can come up with, right? Uh, positive elements on ground that we can uh, build up on our, for our guidelines and uh, further and future randomized trials. Okay. Okay, so Dr. Sugar Baker, uh, the, the yeah. question is like how much of, yeah, of that yes. trial will impact us now? Yeah, yeah, sir, a very good question. Um, I, I, um, I, I, I'm going to go back to Dave Ryan's assessment of this trial. Basically what he said is this quick chip, the oxaliplatinum used at 43 degrees for 30 minutes is gone. It, okay. it doesn't think that, that we should use it at, at all. I personally agree. I would think that if you're going to use neoadjuvant chemotherapy, you need to use mitomycin C at at least 20 milligrams per meter squared for 90 minutes with adequate heat, 42.5 degrees for 90 minutes, okay? If you're not going to use neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and I think your results will be better overall by trying to not use neoadjuvant chemotherapy, then use this perioperative Folfox, which I outlined here, which combines the intraperitoneal 5-FU with an adequate systemic and regional dose of 5-fluorouracil. So for me, that's, that's the outcome. That's the bottom line uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, this uh, uh, trial. No more um, quick chip. Two very good alternatives for you to use. Okay, I have uh, another question, please. Um, at which calculated the PCI, do you advise to stop adding HIPEC for, for those candidates for cytoreductive surgery of colorectal cancer? At which also, calculated PCI, should yes. you advise to stop adding HIPEC for between practice, no expected benefit to cytoreductive surgery for colorectal, in colorectal cancer? Again, very good and fundamental question. I, I think that it's, it's more important that the 
cytoreduction is complete as compared to incomplete. But there's no doubt, and we published a manuscript on this, if you have a complete cytoreduction, the survival does diminish as the PCI increases. So I think mm. the PCI should be 20 or less, and the patient should be evaluated uh, probably by laparotomy, probably by laparotomy. I, I, I have trouble assessing, assessing operability by the laparoscope. Um, so the PCI is, is uh, 20 or less and the cytoreduction must be complete. So I, I don't have a, 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 a threshold. A, a, a number that I can say, oh, I won't go above 15. I do go above 15 uh, upon occasion, especially if it's a young, strong patient. But I, I won't uh, uh, go ahead with the HIPEC and a, a, a complete side of reduction and a potentially curative approach unless I can see that we're going to have a complete side of reduction. So when the yeah, so with those incompletely side to reduce, you don't add, add high peak at all, whatever the PCI. With those incompletely side to reduced, you don't add high peak at all, whatever the PCI is. So I have a little bit of advantage over you. So I, I have a number of different uh, agents and trials that, that uh, I'm involved in. So uh, for example, if a patient has had a lot of prior systemic chemotherapy, they're symptomatic, they need to have an operation, I would do the best side of reduction that I possibly can. And then I would give them intraperitoneal melphalan and then EPIC with uh, pegylated liposomal doxorubicin or what's called doxal. Yep. So okay. I, I would use two drugs. Yes, I would use HIPEC and EPIC, but I wouldn't use a standard drug. We, we can have... talk more about what, what are the possibilities for uh, using kind of an extreme HIPEC in that young patient who uh, uh, needs uh, a surgical procedure and you'd like to add something at the time of surgery uh, to, uh, to augment your... Uh, your, your, your cytoreduction. reduction. We, we have questions from uh, Dr. Hisham Abdel Megid and Dr. Gaman Amera. And I see Dr. Methat Khafagi, he waved his hand. So we have three yeah. so far. So we'll start uh, first, Dr. Hisham, he raised his hand first. Uh, Dr. Hisham okay. Abdel Megid, go ahead. Yes, my question is about the slide where you showed the pay operative full Fox uh, protocol. Yes. I just need some clarification. So. First, you do the cytoreductive surgery. Yes. And this, what's the difference between this bolus dose and the HIPEC oxaliplatin and the continuous infusion? So the continuous infusion is IV infusion, right? Correct. Is there any possibility, Basim, we could go back to that uh, perioperative yeah. Folfox slide? I, I'm grateful to Hisham for, for, for focusing in on this. It took me about five years to come up with this <laughs> perioperative Folfox regimen. I'm very happy with it. Uh, there is some neutropenia that goes with it, but at least from a pharmacologic perspective, it's a, a, a much more satisfying uh, HIPEC. It's actually a, a combination of, of HIPEC and EPIC that all takes place from the operating room. So it's totally under the surgeon's control. Yeah, let me try to share it again. Okay, uh, I'm not. Good luck. Sad. I would not be yeah. able to do it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So share screen, and uh, share. Okay. Wow, you went right to it. Perfect. So take a look at that, Hisham. Does it make uh, Does yeah. it make sense to you? Uh, yeah. If you can just elaborate. Uh, more the details. So, like, what, okay, what does so, the bolus dose mean? 
So here we are. We're finishing. Uh, uh, you can see my little uh, cursor there. We're going to finish the cytoreductive surgery. And as soon as we do, the anesthesiologist, yes, is going to give bolus, 5-fluorouracil, and leucovorin. That's actually to bring the tissue levels of 5-FU up to uh, uh, some synergy with the oxaliplatinum. So the oxaliplatinum. So this is intravenous. This that's is intravenous. intravenous. Correct. Yes, okay. it's given by the uh, given by okay. the anesthesiologist. So then I'm going to put into the peritoneal space 200 milligrams. That's less than and half. Less than much, half of the. How long do you wait between the bolus? Uh, I mean, how? The Good. Time about, about 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah, about 15 minutes right here. It's not. It could be 20 minutes. It could be 25 minutes but just a short time interval. Okay. So this oxaliplatinum goes in as a bolus into the peritoneal space, of course, in about three liters of, uh, of uh, a chemotherapy solution. And it's a full two hours. Whoa, a lot of hyperthermia, a lot of hyperthermia. So you've got two hours at uh, 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 42 degrees or 42.5 degrees and a, a respectable dose. This is the dose of oxaliplatinum that Stuart et al. at Wake Forest worked out. So we took that over from them. But we're adding to that 12 hours now, it's gonna start at the beginning and run right on out here for 12 hours, 12 hours of continuous infusion 5-FU again, given by the anesthesiologist. And you start now, at the same time when you start the high pick. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and you know, we, we do that with a lot of intravenous drugs. Now, we, okay. we, uh, there's several different regimens where during the HIPEC, we have a continuous infusion of an intravenous drug. So now we're here at the end. The patient uh, has had uh, their intestinal reconstruction and uh, the abdomen has been closed, but you leave an additional small catheter and you put in, put so you in as an EPIC. What's that? So you usually do the reconstruction after HIPEC. Always. The, the small bowel anastomosis, always. Always. And okay. we could talk about why that is. It, it comes from, uh, I used to do it before, but I had a lot of suture line recurrences. Okay. About 11% suture line recurrences. So, um, this is 400 milligrams per meter squared of EPIC, two liters of a peritoneal dialysis solution, 400 milligrams per meter squared, that's about 800 milligrams. Just instill it into the peritoneal space, clamp all the drains, leave it for 24 hours. It's also okay. extremely good for preventing adhesions. Just by the way, that's an extremely effective regimen for decreasing the amount of adhesions that you're gonna have. So anyway, this is the, the perioperative Folfox, which is a, a um, you know, by the Goldie-Coleman hypothesis, you want to have two effective drugs given by uh, different routes or, or, or multiple routes to try and reach as many uh, cancer cells as you, as you possibly can. Does I'd love to see uh, a, a clinical trial with uh, this perioperative Folfox. A few more questions regarding this. Does the continuous infusion continue if the, I mean, if you finish the operation, does the continuous infusion continue like maybe in the ICU for yes. the 12 hours? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And, and you use 40, uh, hyperthermia at 43 degrees. This is your standard. No, no, 40, about 42 to 42.5, 43. 43 begins to get a little bit of a problem uh, um, for 120 minutes of 43 degree, that, that's, that's pretty tough on the patient. I would do 42, 42.5. And as you know, I do the open method. Uh, so there's a, a, a very uniform, uh, dis we don't have hot spots, very uniform distribution of the heat and the uh, chemotherapy solution. By the end of about um, uh, one hour, the oxaliplatinum within the peritoneal space is very low. The end of an hour of oxaliplatinum, is, it's not gone completely. It's not gone completely for two hours, but 
you having what this the last hour here is basically systemic effects of 5-FU, systemic effects of oxaliplatinum, and the local regional effects of the heat. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gamal Amera, he's a former uh, chairman of uh, surgery uh, department and National Cancer Institute. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Gamal. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Sugar Baker. My question, why are you against uh, NAC with mitomycin? It might give us uh, an idea of the response uh, and we can check it by radiology. And then we can go with HIPIC and mitomycin C. It will give better results if we have good uh, response by new adjuvant or uh, uh, preoperative mitomycin. So, uh, Gamal, nice to talk to you again. Um, good comment, good question. I don't know the answer to your question, to be very honest with you. Um, we need a trial of, and, and it's currently going on, by the way, uh, out of Eindhoven uh, by uh, Ignis de Hing. Should the neoadjuvant chemotherapy be given up front prior to, my, should the, 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 the Neoadjuvant full Fox chemotherapy be given up front and then mitomycin C HIPEC, or is it best to do the mitomycin C HIPEC followed by uninterrupted uh, eight cycles of, of uh, full Fox? I don't know the answer to that question. I don't think anybody knows the answer to that question. At this point in time, until that data becomes available, I encourage my patients to have the cytoreduction with HIPEC up front and then yes. go to the best uh, uh, adjuvant chemotherapy, the best adjuvant chemotherapy after we get done with the uh, uh, cytoreduction. And as you know, Gamal, from a number of studies, chemotherapy is most effective when you add it when you ask it to do very little. Mm -hmm. So uh, chemotherapy may indeed more, be more effective in a patient who's been completely cytoreduced than in a patient who has uh, a, a large amount of, uh, of disease. That's the Goldie-Coleman hypothesis uh, basically uh, over and over again. I, I have a question not related. Is, it, uh, uh, is there any changes now with the COVID era about your uh, work and about the HIPIC as well, or it didn't affect the job? Uh, it's, it's, had a, it's had a real impact, not on the practice, uh, Gamal, but uh, um, the, the number of cases is yes. dramatically reduced because no, nobody wants to travel. And uh, nobody uh, wants to get on and off an airplane to come uh, receive chemotherapy. I uh, have a tragedy actually uh, to report. I had one, one uh, patient who was in the middle of their adjuvant chemotherapy for uh, mesothelioma and was traveling back and forth uh, in um, late February and he died of COVID. And I'm convinced he died as a result of his uh, airline travel back and forth to uh, Washington uh, Cancer Institute. Uh, so I, I can't blame people for not wanting to travel. And yes. it's had a, a major impact on uh, our uh, on our volumes. Yes, sure. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Thank you. Dr. Methat Khafaga. Dr. Methat Khafaga. Uh, you, Dr. Sugar Baker. Yes, Methat. Uh, I, I think... Your idea of HIPEC is worldwide. I, I think uh, if it is not working, nobody, not everybody will use it. Uh, my question is that I think Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center is uh, running a randomized clinical trial for HIPEC and cytoreductive surgery, or cytoreductive surgery only. 
Do you have an idea what their protocol and if there are any results, early results, or you don't have any idea? Um, Garrett Nash uh, Medat is uh, running that trial. The trial is uh, one of uh, cytoreductive surgery plus HIPEC with mitomycin C versus cytoreductive surgery plus EPIC with uh, FUDR, fluoroxyuridine, not FU, but the FUDR. FUDR is, of course, a, a favorite drug of the uh, group at Memorial Sloan Kettering. It's what Nancy Kemeny has been using for uh, two, de two decades for her intra-arterial infusion uh, for liver metastases. So it is a random, everybody is treated after cider reduction. Some of them treated with HIPEC and others treated with EPIC. I think it's a wonderful trial. I'm, I'm, uh, they've extended the, uh, the uh, accrual. It, it does include both appendiceal and colorectal cancer patients and there's a stratification. Any, any uh, early results? So far, or you, or you don't know? Nobody whispered any results to me. Nope. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sami Ramzi, the, the GI chief uh, of uh, uh, surgical oncology in NCI. Go ahead. Dr. Sami, I think uh, you have to unmute yourself. Okay. You heard me now? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Professor uh, Sugar Baker, for giving us this honor. Uh, my question about uh, the metastatic colorectal cancer that we face sometimes with uh, an operable or uh, uh, good PCI index that we can do uh, or we can achieve R0 resection, but sometimes we could not continue till uh, doing the high pick. Uh, and in this uh, case, we stage the procedure of uh, complete resection, and then we delay the hyper for another session. Uh, what is the ideal time you advise to uh, to do the hyper after uh, complete resection? If not possible to do it at the same setting. Yes, I I understand. I think sometimes there are uh, institutional and. Uh, uh, methodologic uh, limitations. Um, so the sugar baker procedure uh, calls for the cytoreduction and the HIPEC all to be done at the same time. Yeah. Um, and why is that? It's because uh, tumor cell entrapment been studied in the laboratory for decades Tumor cell entrapment is something that, that happens within one hour. Uh, in other words, these cancer cells will become um, embedded in uh, fibrin and blood clot and begin to uh, establish a, a vascularity uh, much more quickly than we would like. Um, really within an hour. And um, I, I am worried actually sometimes that, that the, the HIPEC when we have like a 12 hour case is, uh, is delayed longer than it should be. And I have this way of once I do a uh, a uh, uh, peritoneectomy, say the right or left upper quadrant. Uh, I take a, uh, a laparotomy pad soaked in, uh, in uh, um, uh, um, hydrogen peroxide and stick it up there underneath that hemidiaphragm to try and, and deal as best uh, I can with uh, the potential entrapment of tumor cells at that site and yeah. frequently washing during the uh, procedure to remove any uh, stray cancer cells. So my answer to your question is, HIPEC with a delay of 
12 to 24 hours is probably better than no high pec. But uh, I've started a goodly number of high pecs at 12 o'clock at night in order to, uh, in order to get the uh, high pec uh, completed as a, a single uh, surgical procedure. I know that there's a lot of places around the world that do believe in a staged uh, cytoreduction reduction with high pec, but I would rather not do it if it's at all possible. Yeah. And in case we have to stage the procedures, would you advise uh, 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 dividing the procedure of peritonectomy rather than completing the peritonectomy and uh, delaying the high pick? I mean, could we divide all the peritonectomy in two halves and the high and repeat the high pick with every half of the procedure? Based on your theory, um, I'm not. I'm trying to think how I would. I would actually. Would actually try and 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 best divide up the uh, the high pec or divide up the peritoneectomy procedures. Um, you could do the upper and mid abdomen and then do the uh, pelvis uh, and say low anterior resection. That might be reasonable. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Muhammad Abdul Hamid and Dr. Hisham Abdul Megid again. So we we'll start with Dr. Muhammad Abdul Hamid. Go ahead. Dr. Muhammad. Yes, Dr. Bassem, thanks, Dr. Becker, yes. Uh, my question is about uh, the presence of uh, hepatic liver metastasis in, in addition to peritoneal uh, disease. Yes. What extent to what we can go for hepatectomy in such a group of patients? Uh, very good question because this is something that uh, comes up uh, uh, comes up oh, uh, once or twice a month for us. Uh, um, so if you have one or two liver metastases, certainly not more than three, and you have a low PCI under 10, I think it's reasonable to try and do both procedures. Uh, again, I would try and do it all at once if, uh, if uh, that's possible, and then use the HIPEC. My results uh, with um, the management of peritoneal metastases in combination with liver metastases uh, it, it gives a, a low survival, something like 10% at five years. Now, maybe there's been some palliation in there, but uh, I'm always discouraged when even I find one liver metastasis, which uh, sometimes is, you know, on the edge of the liver and you can just uh, uh, take it off uh, with uh, uh, a minimal resection. But it, that, that uh, is a very poor prognostic indicator. Um, uh, Mohammed, it, it is amazing. It is amazing, just for example, if I have lymph node negative, peritoneal metastases, I have uh, in a large number of patients, so it's uh, about 40 patients, the survival is better than 50% at 10 years. That's lymph node negative peritoneal metastases from colorectal cancer. As soon as they have even one lymph node metastasis, it drops to a little bit less than half, about 23% at five years. So the presence of metastatic disease, whether it's lymph node metastases or liver metastases, uh, is a very poor prognostic uh, indicator for our work with, uh, <coughs> with peritoneal metastases. I do it, yes, and, and I do it, especially if there's a complete removal of all visible disease. Okay. Thank you. okay, thank you. If we don't have uh, any further question, we could go to the case with Dr. Hisham. 
Uh, I, I will go ahead with one question, then go ahead with the case presentation. Uh, re, uh, regarding the small bowel or the bowel anastomosis or reconstruction, which you do after the HIPEC, do you leave during the HIPEC infusion, do you leave the bowel uh, open? I mean, does it does this cause soiling or do you maybe close the bowel with the intestinal clamps until you go back and reconstruct it? It's so Hisham, we, we, when we're going to do it like a, a, a large bowel resection or a small bowel resection, <coughs> we would just uh, divide the bowel with a, uh, a stapler. Ah, okay. Divide the bowel with a stapler, stapler do a, a generous uh, removal of the uh, mesentery uh, because you sometimes will have, uh, if you've got a well-established small bowel uh, implant, you, you can have uh, metastases within the uh, regional lymph nodes. So uh, do your generous resection, both of small bowel or large bowel. Just drop the, uh, drop the ends of the bowel back into the uh, peritoneal space and uh, wash away. Okay, and so you I, as you know, I'm, 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 I'm uh, uh, just about as enthusiastic about about the mechanical aspects of HIPEC. In other words, uh, debriding the bowel, washing it, uh, scrubbing it with, uh, with, a, uh, with a laparotomy pad, a and as I am with, with the uh, chemical effects. I, I think that it's, it's, it's a combined uh, treatment. I, I'm afraid that once those cells, like in gastric cancer, okay, gastric cancer, we do a terrible job with HIPEC. And the reason is that the, in gastric cancer, those, those cells are, are actually caught up in the lymphatic lacunae. We don't get HIPEC into those lymphatic lacunae. We'll do a surface treatment. We can, we can destroy the free cancer cells, but uh, anything that's uh, uh, embedded in lymphatics, uh, that's vascularized, uh, it's, it's unlikely if that if those small nodules are left behind, it's unlikely that HIPEC is going to be of any any uh, real benefit. Uh, Dr. Hisham, I think Dr. Ahmed Mustafa, he uh, he raised his yes. hand and, and, and he's well known to Dr. Sugar Baker. He is a yes. surgeon operated with you, Dr. Sugar Baker. So you, yes, you better correct. remember. Yeah. Uh, hello, Dr. Sugar Baker. It's always Good nice to see, to, yes. to see you again. And I hope we can see you. Uh, in Egypt, it's going to happen. Next it's time. going to happen. We just have to be patient. Yes, we have to be uh, my, very patient. <laughs> mm. Yes, and um, my question, um, as regard, does the the pathology as regard mucinous or non mucinous yes type colorectal cancer affect the decision? Uh, and does the second point does the the biological markers the the KRAS and the BRAF affect the, the, the surgical decision in a way or another? Um, so do they affect my uh, surgical uh, decision-making yes, process? Yes. No, they yeah. do not. Okay, thank you. I, will, I will operate on a, a BRAF patient. Uh, uh, um, the, 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 uh, Dr. Mustafa, the only group of patients that I don't like to take on are the signet ring colons. Yes. The signet ring colons. I, I have a couple of long-term survivors, but it's just because they had a complete response to systemic chemotherapy. I don't think that my cytoreductive surgery had anything to do uh, with their long-term survival. Uh, so signet ring adenocarcinoma, I don't operate on. I just recommend the absolute best systemic chemotherapy. I know that if I have um, uh, <coughs> molecular markers uh, that uh, uh, indicate uh, a more virulent disease process, the cytoreductive surgery in HIPEC will be uh, less effective. Uh, I might just say we, we talked about the... Uh, the Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, Gamil asked about the M Memorial Sloan Kettering trial. They will not allow BRAF people into that trial. Okay, so there yeah. are some people who say no, if they've got a really uh, uh, 
Uh, bad, ominous, bad a really ominous molecular marker. Uh, don't don't try the cytoreductive surgery with HIPEC. I have not gotten to that point. The only ones I will uh, not uh, take on are the signet rings. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, if Dr. Ahmed Tuni, I think uh, he he sent me a message in the chat. If he has a question, he could go ahead, and after that, we could go for the case. Thank you, Beth. Beth. Thank you, uh, Professor Sugarbaker, for this wonderful talk. Uh, my question, you already answered it about gastric cancer, the role of high pick for gastric cancer. And I remember I asked you about a, a specific case in the NCI conference, and you just told me you stopped doing these cases. So do you have something to add about this point? Yes. Uh... Ahmed, I, uh, <clears throat> I'm not enthusiastic <clears throat> about um, extensive cytoreductive surgery for patients with established peritoneal metastases. However, I uh, am convinced that patients who have um, cirrhosal positive primary gastric cancer or gastric cancer with positive cytology are excellent candidates for uh, gastrectomy, uh, D1 plus gastrectomy or D2. Uh, just wanna get all those lymph nodes out. So gastrectomy plus HIPEC. And you know, there's eight different randomized studies that show that primary gastric cancer, T3 or T4, uh, with uh, uh, or without uh, um, peritoneal metastases show a survival advantage with HIPEC. So I'm enthusiastic about treating that group of patients. I'm not so enthusiastic about treating patients who have established peritoneal metastases unless it's a very, very small PCI, six or less, very, very small PCI. Or Ahmed, the other group of patients that I've taken on are what are often referred to as the super responders. So it's a patient with gastric cancer or with peritoneal CD and they got flaught, and there's no disease left by any parameters. I will go, I will do cytoreduction, gastrectomy uh, on that group of patients. Almost always they have residual disease within the stomach, within the primary gastric cancer. I will uh, uh, do the greater omentectomy in a woman oophorectomy and give them HIPEC and I'll tell myself that I've done them a favor. Does that make sense to you? Sure, thank you very much. Okay. Okay, I think we, uh, we, we're beyond, and I'm sure all of us uh, have too much question to discuss, and uh, it's a very uh, interesting topic. Uh, I think for the sake of time, uh, we could go over the, the case presentation. Uh, okay. Hisham, if you're talking, I think you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes we, we could. Got you, Hisham. Yeah. And can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, so it's a 46-year-old female patient born in 1975, presented to National Cancer Institute uh, at, the, at the end of last year with abdominal distension of one year duration. The CT done in October showed marked ascites, diffuse peritoneal thickening, dilated appendix, eight by three centimeters, and left at the next cystic lesion, six by five centimeters. These are her marker. Acetic fluid cytology was a cellular mucinous material suggestive of mucinous tumor. 
Her CT scan done at the NCI showed evidence of mesenteric nodularity, peritoneal thickening, and momentous soft tissue thickening. Largest at the left lumbar region, six by three centimeters, was uh, associated capsular thickening along abdominal and pelvic visceral organs, associated with scalloping of the outer surface of the liver, small paraortic lymph nodes, pelvic soft tissue like tumification. These are some of the images from the CT. You can see the abdomen, uh, the standard typical cinematoma case, more sagittal cuts. This is to scroll through the CT. Patient underwent operation uh, this month. She underwent omentectomy and debulking of large peritoneal deposits, appendectomy, and bilateral ovariectomy. Uh, intraoperatively, the patient's hemoglobin was ranging around seven. So the anesthesia, they asked us to not, not continue with the long procedure. So our decision was just to debulk and stage the procedure for later. This is the appendix on the left, we can see which was removed. In the middle, you can see the two very masses and of course the peritoneal disease. So the patient has residual on, on the liver, uh, like on the below the right side of the diaphragm. And you can see the whole, all the bowel is, uh, there's a thin layer of mucinous tumor covering all the bowel and the mesentery. This is a comparison between the abdomen before and after the operation. Post-operative, in the, in the post-operative period, patient got uh, diagnosed with COVID, but fortunately there were no respiratory symptoms and she passed a smooth post-operative course and was discharged one week later. This is the post-operative CT. We can see a small pneumonic, pneumonic patch. And this is the post-operative CT showing residual disease. This is a video of the post-operative CT. The pathology report was uh, appendicular mucus in this adenocarcinoma with bilateral ovarian and omental mats. So the questions I have is like, should we go for a, to, uh, for a completion of the site reduction? If yes, when is the optimum timing? Do you do it maybe one month or up to three months after the surgery? And considering the pandemic and that the patient already got diagnosed with COVID, but then got passed smoothly, would we still go for the site reduction in this time? And what's, what kind of hypic would, which, uh, would we use? Which regimen? And what would be the follow-up plan afterwards? Thank you. So, um, Hisham, very, uh, very impressive case. Uh, and I, I would just have one comment to, to, to begin. Uh, you got to be careful with these patients. It, it's really amazing what you can do for an alive patient. And, and if you get too aggressive uh, with uh, a debilitated uh, a patient like this, you, you, can, you can lose it all. So yeah. I agree completely with uh, your uh, judgment to do a debulking procedure and uh, come back uh, uh, at another time. So you showed some very nice pictures of this uh, uh, surface of the small bowel that looks like it's just totally involved by pseudomyxoma. 
I would, uh, I, I'll, I'll make a bet that you could trim huge amounts of that, that uh, material from the surface of the small bowel. It'll just be acellular mucus. So leaving that sort of, I've left the, the, that very ragged, very kind of ragged surface of the small bowel behind on many occasions, it doesn't seem to progress. And if you biopsy it extensively, it's just uh, a fibrin and uh, mucus all kind of mixed together. So the big question is, um, when does she come back and get her right and left upper quadrant peritoneectomy? She's probably going to need a splenectomy also. And uh, she may need a pelvic peritoneectomy. Hopefully, you won't need to do any visceral resections, but you may. And um, I would just see her on a, uh, you know, uh, uh, six weeks uh, basis and uh, would not be in a hurry to reoperate on her. It's a very, very indolent disease process. If you operated on her six months from now, I think that would be uh, a good plan. I'd make sure she's gotten uh, her immunizations or her vaccinations uh, for COVID uh, before you uh, move ahead. And I probably would just use uh, mitomycin C. Okay. Um, moderate, moderate dose mitomycin C. I use the mitomycin C with fluorouracil given systemically, um, but uh, I, I would use, I'd, I'd probably use mitomycin C. And her prognosis actually uh, to be alive and well 10 years from now is pretty good. Her prognosis to be cured is small, is small. Uh, but uh, I think I think that uh, this uh, this kind of patient can be uh, greatly benefited by uh, a repeat, an, another surgery if you can talk her into it. She may not. Uh, she may be doing so well uh, that uh, she's just going to kind of uh, w work along for a while. You'll you'll have to see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Sugar Baker, and. Uh... Thank you for uh, this time. Thank you for everyone. I uh, I enjoy all the time learning from you, Dr. Sugar Baker, and uh, it's a pleasure to be together with uh, my uh, uh, group in uh, Egypt, where I grew up and learned oh. my first steps. So thank you all. Well, we'll you we'll have to get down to Staten Island to say hello to you down there. Oh, it's pleasure. Yeah, thank okay. you. But we have to we have to go to eat in New Jersey. <laughs> we have to do what? To go to take a dinner in New Jersey. They don't allow us in uh, in New York. To, in, oh, in okay. Yeah, all right. Yes. Well, but, yeah. It's been a couple months from now. But New well, Jersey is not far. It's 20 minutes. Okay. All right. right. I will live in New Jersey. All right. Very good. Thank very you. Very nice seminar, Basine. Thanks for sending it up. It was, uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Professor Sugarbaker. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yep. Good to see everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.